your discretion is advised. Screams of fear and pain shattered the early morning silence of a working class Victorian community, leading to the grisly discovery of a body stuffed into a kitchen cupboard. A 20-year-old woman had been hacked and slashed to death with a cleaver. Yet, as we often see on Dreadfully Curious, what's more chilling than the anonymity of infamous killers like Jack the Ripper is the inescapable brutality of ordinary people turned extraordinary killers. Believe it or not, this Victorian true crime saga ends with the agonies of dysentery on the high seas. But it begins in the grimy streets of Warrington, England, with a gruesome murder in 1851. During the 1850s, Warrington was experiencing the effects of the Industrial Revolution, which brought both prosperity and challenges. The town had a growing population due to the influx of workers drawn by industrial jobs. This growth led to overcrowded housing, with many people living in cramped and unsanitary conditions. Diseases such as cholera were common, and life expectancy was relatively low due to poor living conditions and industrial hazards. The town streets were often dirty and poorly maintained, with limited access to clean water and proper sewage systems. Factories and mills dominated the landscape and pollution from these industries contributed to the harsh living conditions. Child labor and long working hours were common in the factories, reflecting the difficult economic and social realities of the time. In the shadow of industrial progress, Warrington's streets reeked of filth, desperation, and decay, the perfect breeding ground for both disease and violence. 41-year-old Bridget Lyons lived in this challenging place with her 21-year-old husband, Patrick Lyons. The couple lived with other tenants in a house at Bank Street. Fellow residents included the victim, 20-year-old Margaret, or Peggy Fay, and Margaret's roommate, Peggy Collins. Margaret Fay and Bridget Lyons were both peddlers. In the 19th century, especially in rural or less accessible areas, peddlers were an important part of the economy, bringing goods to people who might not have easy access to stores or markets. They were a common sight in towns and villages as well as in urban areas, where they would travel from house to house or set up in public spaces to sell their wares. Peddlers carried a variety of small, portable, everyday items that were in demand among the general population. These goods were typically affordable and practical, catering to the needs of households, workers, and individuals in both rural and urban settings. Some common wares that peddlers might carry included perfumes, soaps, tools like scissors and knives, spices, clothing, jewelry, foodstuffs, and numerous other products. Peddlers like Bridget Lyons and Margaret Fay played a crucial role in bridging the gap between more urbanized areas like Warrington and the rural surroundings of Newton and Winwick. We know from reporting the women frequented these towns. While Newton, Lee Willows, and Winwick are relatively close to Warrington by modern standards, in the 19th century, even short distances could represent significant journeys. Peddlers often traveled on foot, carrying heavy baskets of goods. The distance they covered each day would depend on the terrain, the weather, and the weight of their loads. They might walk several miles each day, sometimes over rough or muddy roads, to reach small villages or isolated farmsteads. Peddlers operated with no guarantee of making a sale. They might walk all day and only sell a few items, or none at all, depending on the needs and financial situation of the people they encounter. For most, this was not a lucrative profession. The economic pressure on peddlers was immense. Many lived hand-to-mouth, relying on daily sales to buy food and basic necessities. If they had a bad day, they might go hungry or be unable to afford a place to sleep. Many peddlers turned to this profession out of economic necessity. They might have lacked the skills or opportunities to secure more stable employment. 
For most Victorian peddlers, survival was a daily gamble, with poverty and hunger lurking behind every unsold item. The line between honest trade and desperation-fueled crime was razor thin, and in their vulnerable state, they were just as likely to fall prey to violence as they were to commit it. A few days before the murder, on February 1, 1851, witnesses observed the victim, Peggy Fay, speaking with her fellow peddler and housemate, Bridget Lyons. Peggy was said to have shown Bridget and others some silver she'd earned, while the women compared baskets after a day of peddling. The suffocating proximity of the living quarters adds a deeply unsettling layer to what's about to unfold. Pat and Bridget Lyons didn't live in a separate bedroom, but occupied a cramped space at the top of the stairs in the home, just beyond the threshold of the small room where Peggy Fay and Peggy Collins slept. In these oppressive conditions, the thin veil of privacy dissolved completely, leaving every sound, breath, and movement felt by all. On the night before the murder, February 3, 1851, Pat Lyons went to bed first, followed by Bridget, and then the two Peggies. Peggy Collins shared a room with the victim and had lived in the home for about a week leading up to the murder. She actually also shared a bed with the victim, who she now knew, but not particularly well. It was quite common in Victorian times, particularly among the working class and those with limited means, to share beds with individuals who were essentially strangers. Many working class families lived in cramped, overcrowded housing with limited space. Multiple people often shared rooms or even beds simply because there was no other option. In boarding or lodging houses, which were common in Victorian cities, it was not unusual for tenants to share beds with other lodgers. Space was often rented by the bed rather than by the room, and privacy was a luxury many could not afford. In the very early morning hours of Tuesday, February 4, 1851, Peggy Collins was in bed with about-to-be-murdered roommate Peggy Fay, who was sound asleep. Collins heard Pat Lyons get up first, walking down to the kitchen for some breakfast, or tea perhaps. He's next heard calling for his wife Bridget, who rises and joins her husband in the kitchen. Bridget Lyons then enters the upstairs bedroom. She wakes Peggy Fay, telling her it was time to get up and head out with her baskets. Peggy Fay did so while Peggy Collins stayed in bed. She didn't close the door all the way on her way out. Within moments of Peggy and Bridget leaving the bedroom for the kitchen, Collins heard a blood-curdling scream. She later testified that she felt the scream as much as she'd heard it. The sound was so alarming and out of the ordinary that Collins got up and started getting dressed. Her intention was to investigate what the hell was going on in the kitchen? But before she'd finished getting dressed, Bridget Lyons entered the room. Screams were still audible during this period. Bridget claimed there was a drunk man in the kitchen who had become disorderly. This seemed ridiculous to Collins, who tried to leave the room. When she did, Bridget threw her in the bed, holding her down under a blanket to prevent her from leaving. The violence felt omnipresent. What sounded like cries of murder echoed up the narrow staircase from the kitchen. The crime was heard and sensed alongside the creak and shudder of the building, as though the walls themselves bore witness. Peggy Collins, understandably quite alarmed, was able to get free from Margaret holding her on the bed. She got to the window and told Bridget she'd open it and scream murder if not released. Margaret allowed her to exit the room and go downstairs to the kitchen. As she stepped into a dark kitchen, she stepped into what she thought was blood. Margaret assured her that it was just water spilled by the drunk man she and her husband Pat Lyons blamed for the ruckus. Peggy Collins must have been gripped by sheer terror in these moments, realizing how close she had come to being part of a brutal murder. Just feet away from her, Bridget Lyons had lured her roommate to her death, and Collins had unknowingly been lying in bed just seconds from becoming a witness, or worse, the next victim. Collins was forced to navigate a house heavy with violence, where the stench of death lingered alongside the lies of the murderers. Every step she took, barefoot and vulnerable, deepened her fear, 
especially as she felt the wetness underfoot that Bridget assured her was only water. Peggy Collins was quite disturbed. She didn't go to police, though. Not right away, anyway. She smoked a pipe and pondered the horror of what she thought she'd witnessed. She actually goes back to the Lion's home to retrieve her shoes later in the day, cautiously. Peggy Collins more than suspected something violent had occurred in the kitchen early that morning. She likely knew how lucky she was to have escaped it. At this time, she notices Margaret Lyons being very standoffish and behaving suspiciously. She was particularly guarded about the coal hole, a cupboard of sorts in the kitchen. These were often enclosed spaces where coal was stored for household use. While it wasn't exactly a kitchen cupboard like we think of today, it was commonly located near or in the kitchen, since coal was the primary fuel used for heating and cooking. Coal holes and similar storage spaces could have been used to conceal a body, especially in Victorian times, when coal was a ubiquitous part of everyday life. These small, often dark and enclosed spaces were relatively hidden from regular view and were large enough in many cases to store or conceal a body. Other neighbors, too, had heard the shrieks of a murder, but what they mistook for a fight between Mr. and Mrs. Lyons, in reality, was the killing of Peggy Fahey. Peggy Collins, bedmate to the suspected murder victim, did not feel safe staying in the Lyons' home. She slept elsewhere that night and didn't go to police until the next day. More than 24 hours had elapsed since ghastly shrieks of fear and pain echoed from the Lyons' kitchen. Sergeant John Brandwood was the policeman investigating the concern. He found the Lyons' home shut up and locked. When he tracked Bridget Lyons down in a neighbor's house, he compelled her to come with him to the place of the suspected murder, her kitchen. Bridget refused to unlock the door to her home, but a helpful neighbor procured a spare that Sergeant Brand would use to gain entry. He at first found nothing, but under the stairs leading up from the kitchen to the sleeping quarters was another cupboard. As Sergeant Brandwood began to open it, Bridget tried to take off, but he grabbed her. While keeping hold of her, he got the small cupboard open and discovered the dead body of Margaret Faye. Peggy to her friends. Body was partially on its side, facing the back wall of the cupboard, back to the door. Horrific wounds on the body matched a meat cleaver stashed in an ash hole. Peggy Faye had been chopped to death. It wasn't the wild ravings of a drunk person or a couple fighting the neighbors had heard. It also hadn't been water that murder victim bedmate Collins had stepped in. This was intentional homicide. Bridget Lyons was arrested under suspicion of murder, but police couldn't initially track down her husband, Patrick Lyons. It took several days, but eventually on February 10, Pat Lyons was tracked to London, destined for Dublin. He'd just enlisted in the East India Company and was being shipped abroad. Convenient timing. Enlisting in the East India Company's service during the Victorian era meant joining one of the most powerful and influential organizations of the time, which operated both as a trading corporation and a governing body in large parts of India and other territories around the world. The company had its own military and civilian branches, and enlisting could lead to service in various capacities, particularly in colonial regions under British control. Enlisting was a way for many individuals particularly those from impoverished or limited circumstances, to escape geographically or start life fresh. For Irish and British men, it offered the opportunity to leap behind difficult conditions at home, seek steady employment, and perhaps even rise in social or economic status, despite the risks and hardships of serving in distant colonies. It was a chance for a new beginning, though it came with no guarantees of success or safety. However, there were darker reasons driving some who enlisted in the East India Company. For some, it provided an opportunity for individuals to escape the consequences of criminal activity, even murder. The vast distances and the chaotic nature of life in the colonies could provide a new beginning, away from the reach of localized law enforcement activities. Mr. Lyons, like his wife, was arrested under suspicion of murder. 
At trial, he blamed the much older and very jealous Bridget Lyons for Peggy's murder. She, after first denying all knowledge, blamed him for the killing. We've got more ground to cover. Coming up is the verdict, followed by a disturbingly detailed explanation of dysentery at sea. The final fate of one of our murderers. But first, how being attacked with a chopper can harm the body. The knife, often used in kitchens or butcher shops, had a broad, heavy blade designed for hacking through meat and bone. When wielded with force, it could easily cleave through soft tissue and sever vital structures in the human body. In the case of the victim, it wasn't just the act of cutting that caused death. It was the devastation the blade inflicted upon the body's critical systems. An attack with a chopper or butcher knife can have devastating effects. Contact with the neck or head, areas where major blood vessels and airway are both exposed and vulnerable, can be particularly dangerous. A blade-sharp edge can tear through the carotid artery or jugular vein, unleashing a torrent of blood that rapidly drains life from the victim. Blood loss of this magnitude leads to hypovolemic shock, a state where the body can no longer maintain enough blood flow to vital organs, resulting in unconsciousness and, ultimately, death within minutes. Other direct damage to nerves and other biological structures can have devastating effects as well. The vagal response is triggered when the vagus nerve, one of the major nerves running through the body, experiences sudden extreme stimulation due to trauma. This nerve helps regulate heart rate, blood pressure, and breathing, among other vital functions. In cases of extreme injury, such as a cut or compression of the neck where the vagus nerve resides, the body can react almost instantly by slowing the heart rate to dangerously low levels or even stopping it altogether. This response, though meant to protect the body in some scenarios, can rapidly accelerate death in the context of severe trauma. When the vagus nerve is overstimulated, the body's defense mechanisms backfire, leading to a catastrophic drop in blood pressure and a collapse in circulation, even before significant blood loss occurs. In some cases, death can occur almost immediately, as the body essentially shuts down due to the nerve's overwhelming reaction to injury. Fatal outcomes in attacks like this can also come from air embolism, when a major vein, especially in the neck, like the jugular vein, is severed. The vacuum created by the pumping action of the heart can pull air in to the bloodstream. If a significant amount of air is sucked into a large blood vessel, it can travel to the heart or lungs. Once in the heart, an air embolism can block flow by creating an air lock, preventing the heart from effectively pumping blood. If it travels to the lungs, it can obstruct blood flow to the pulmonary arteries, causing a rapid collapse of the respiratory and circulatory systems. The trial of Mr. and Mrs. Lyons for the murder of Peggy Fay did not reveal exactly what occurred that night. Did Margaret physically attack Peggy, or was it just her husband? Did she actually save the life of Peggy Collins by preventing her from intervening in the kitchen murder being perpetrated downstairs by Pat Lyons? All questions that weren't conclusively answered in court. Nor did they need to be for a verdict to be returned. Mr. and Mrs. Lyons were found guilty of the murder of Peggy Fay. Both were sentenced to death. Patrick Lyons did so by hanging at Kirkdale Jail in Liverpool. On April 26, 1851, he was led from his cell through the jail's press room and to the gallows that had been erected in the northeast section of the jail in an elevated position, making the gallows visible to much of the broader Liverpool area, a spectacle of death and justice for the masses. Patrick bowed several times to the crowd that had gathered, as if thanking them for their attention. Reporting at the time indicates that he confessed in his final moments and made numerous mentions of God, sin, and his hope for forgiveness. The trapdoor was released and he fell hard, but didn't die instantly. He struggled some before becoming still. His wife, Bridget, was likewise destined for the gallows for her role in the murder. That was not what happened. Bridget's sentence was commuted to life in prison sparing her the immediate fate of the noose, but sentencing her to a far slower and more agonizing death. Instead of the quick finality of execution, 
she faced the grim sentence of transportation to Van Diemen's land, a feared penal colony on the other side of the world. However, she would never reach her destination. By May 6, 1852, while still at sea, Bridget was struck down by dysentery, a relentless and painful illness marked by severe diarrhea, dehydration, and unbearable abdominal cramps. Described in the medical records as an old woman of broken-down constitution from age and mental anxiety, the physical and emotional toll of her sentence weakened her already fragile state. For over a month, she endured the disease's painful symptoms, battling for breath as her body was slowly drained of strength and fluids. The ship's surgeon, Dr. L.T. Cunningham, recorded her suffering as she strained and wasted away a process crueler than the gallows. Dysentery, particularly in the conditions faced by prisoners like Bridget Lyons aboard convict ships, is a uniquely horrifying disease that attacks both the body and dignity with ruthless efficiency. Caused by Shingella, or Entamoeba histolytica, dysentery spreads rapidly through contaminated water and food, both of which were common on overcrowded ships where waste, vermin, and filth mingled unchecked. The disease primarily attacks the intestines, breaking down the protective lining of the gut. The intestines become inflamed and begin to leak, allowing blood and mucus to mix with waste material. The patient suffers from severe diarrhea, often accompanied by excruciating abdominal cramps and rectal pain. Each trip to the latrine, or in the case of convicts at sea, a bucket or makeshift waste area, would be an agonizing ordeal, marked by straining and bloody stools. The frequency of these bowel movements can be relentless as the body struggles to expel the invading bacteria, but it only serves to worsen the condition. With each passing day, the dehydration becomes more severe, the body, already struggling with poor nutrition and harsh living conditions, starts to break down as it loses vital fluids and electrolytes. Muscles cramp and weaken, the skin dries out, and the brain becomes foggy. Vital organs, deprived of the necessary fluids to function, begin to shut down. The kidneys may stop working properly, leading to a dangerous buildup of waste in the body. And as the heart strains to pump, what little blood remains, it too begins to fail. As dysentery worsens, the immune system weakens, allowing secondary infections to take hold. Fever often sets in, with the body fluctuating between sweats and chills. Delirium can accompany the fever, and the patient may experience hallucinations or confusion as the brain is starved of oxygen and blood flow. On a ship like the Sir Robert Seppings, dysentery spread easily. The filth of human waste, much of it infected, contaminated both the living quarters and the food supplies. Rats and vermin, themselves carriers of disease, scurried freely between the waste buckets, food stores, and sleeping convicts. These rats would have crawled across waste-soaked decks and food scraps, contaminating whatever they touched with a cocktail of bacteria and filth. As the ship remained at sea for weeks, these conditions worsened, waste accumulated, sanitation broke down, and the air became thick with the stench of feces and decay. Here's a morbid timeline of dysentery and the environmental decay faced by a convicted killer, Bridget Lyons. Bridget's first symptoms appeared around May 6, about seven weeks in to the voyage. Initially, it began with mild diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and a general feeling of malaise. At this point, the ship's conditions were bad, but not yet catastrophic. Waste management was already strained, and the air below deck carried a stale, musty smell. However, the makeshift waste buckets were still in place, though frequently overflowing. Rats and German cockroaches, common pests on ships, scuttled across the floors, but hadn't yet taken full control of the convict quarters. Bridget likely tried to continue her daily routine though each trip to relieve herself grew increasingly painful and bloody. By mid-May, her condition worsened. The diarrhea became relentless, and Bridget would have began passing blood and mucus, a clear sign that dysentery had fully taken hold. With every agonizing trip to the foul-smelling latrines or the increasingly unsanitary buckets, 
her body lost more fluids and electrolytes. Dehydration set in, causing muscle cramps and intense thirst, though the water on board was already tainted, making each ship a risk for further contamination. By this time, the ship's environment deteriorated rapidly. Human waste overflowed from the makeshift containers, spilling onto the floors and creating puddles of filth that mixed with spilt food and stagnant water. The rats and cockroaches flourished, their numbers growing as they fed on discarded food, scurrying through both waste and supplies. They crawled indiscriminately across convicts, food stores, and fecal matter, spreading bacteria and filth with every movement. Bridget, like all others, could not escape the oppressive stench of urine and feces that filled the air, worsening her condition with each passing day. As May drew to a close, Bridget's health spiraled downward. Her dehydration worsened, causing confusion, weakness, and dry, cracked skin. Fever began to take hold, her body sweating profusely, only to shiver uncontrollably as chills set in. She lay in her filthy quarters, surrounded by others enduring the same fate, her mind clouded by delirium. Her bowel movements now were uncontrollable, mostly blood and watery discharge, her body ravaged by the bacterial infection. By early June, Bridget's body was failing. Her kidneys, deprived of fluids, could no longer filter the toxins building in her bloodstream, causing her skin to yellow and her pulse to weaken. She was now unable to move much, drifting in and out of consciousness, her abdomen racked with cramping pain as the dysentery continued its relentless assault. On June 14, Bridget finally succumbed. Her organs, unable to function without fluids, gave out, and she slipped into a coma-like state before her heart finally stopped. The multi-organ failure, brought on by dehydration, infection, and malnutrition, took her quietly after weeks of suffering. Bridget died two months before the ship reached Van Diemen's land. Her sentence had spared her a public execution, but it delivered her to a far slower, more torturous end. <laughs>